So, um, hello everyone and welcome to the 3PGC webinar. The 3PGC, or Three Principles Global Community, is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. You can learn more about uh, the Three Principles Global Community at 3PGC.org. And today, um, I'm excited to say that we have Michael Neal with us. Michael is an internationally renowned transformative coach and the best-selling author of The Inside Out Revolution and The Space Within. He has spent over 25 years as a coach, advisor, friend, mentor. Sorry, I'm trying to block out the, <laughs> the little noise there. Let me get back to that. So Michael has spent over 25 years as a coach, advisor, friend, mentor, and creative spark plug to celebrities, CEOs, royalty, and people who want to get more out of themselves and their lives. His books have been translated into 17 languages, and his public talks, retreats, and seminars have touched and transformed lives at the United Nations and on six continents around the world. Michael's week radio show, Living from the Inside Out, has been a listener favorite on Hay House Radio for over a decade. His TEDx talk, Why Aren't We Awesomer, has been viewed by over 150,000 people around the world. And you can follow Michael on Twitter and Facebook and get access to the Caffeine for Your Soul podcast and blog at www.michaelneal.org. And I'll post all this um, for anybody watching the video. I'll post all this on the bottom of the YouTube video so you can have access to. So um, I'm always excited to hear what Michael has to share. It's always fun listening to him. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I, I always feel when I hear my bio that I should be more exciting. Um, <laughs> it does. It sounds very, I, I kind of expect Tony Robbins to come on after that. It's like, da -da! Um, but uh, you just got me. So hello. And I, I wanted to explore something today that I think was one of one it was one of the biggest things for me when I first came across the principles that turned it from another cool self help methodology into something fundamentally different from that and if, I'll do a very brief version of the the story because most people have in the community have heard my origin story because it's in it, it's in the books about how I came across this. But essentially, I was making my, my living and my, my fortune and my fame from what I had learned about how to create good feelings. So I had seen that our feelings were created out of thought, or at least I thought I'd seen that. Like I, you know, and, and I thought, so the best thing you can do is, um, you know, as long as you're going to make stuff up, make up good stuff. And so I taught people how to create feelings of well-being, feelings of gratitude, feelings of forgiveness, feelings of peace. And this was important to me because up until I came across the principles, my experience of myself was as a kind of messed up human being who'd done really well for himself, like who'd found a way to push through all that messed upness and be relatively happy and relatively high functioning. What I didn't have any room for in my head, what I didn't believe in, what I didn't, I didn't have any truck with the idea that there was anything that was not created, that there was anything that was not part of our subjective or constructed reality. So from my point of view, everything was made up and so, therefore, the only way to have a better life was to make up better stuff. And there was no room in there for, uh, I just lost, there we go. There was no room in there for truth. Like, I thought truth was, was, was something that, uh, you know, not very bright people talked about. Um, <laughs> I, I was a little judgmental, um, but, but there was a downside to that. And the downside to that was that I, I, I had a kind of a cynical view of things because to me it was clearly all made up and there was no underlying truth. 
it, it was kind of, I remember one of, one of the guys who created NLP saying, not, it was a John Grinder saying, when you really understand how this stuff works, the hardest thing is keeping a straight face. And it was so manipulative, but it was manipulating people for good. Like, it, 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 you know, I remember somebody accusing me once in a seminar and going, you're just trying to make me feel good. And I was like, yeah, is that, is that a problem? <laughs> so it wasn't, I, I still don't think of it as evil. It was just, you know, I was doing what made sense to me to do given how the world looked to me. Well, the first insight that I had, the, the, the game changer for me, was when I heard Sid Bank say in a video, Every human being is sitting in the middle of mental health. They just don't know it. And, and I don't know how or why, but I knew that was true. Like I heard that and it was no question, absolutely 100%. Oh my God, that's true. Babies are born happy. They're not born messed up in that way. And, and I could see it about myself. And I laughed for five, 10 minutes, beer snorting out my nose. And, and then I went, oh no, I, I was actually about to go out on a book tour promoting my book, Feel Happy Now, about how to create all these good feelings. And I just thought, oh my God, they're innate. They're built into the system there. They were already there. And once I saw that truth that, that there were things that were just true, that, that weren't dependent on whether or not I believed in them or thought about them. You know, so we always use the analogy of gravity, right? Gravity does not work like a Roadrunner cartoon where Wile E. Coyote's fine until he looks down, right? Gravity just, it's just there. It's a pre-existing thing. And I started to see that there really were pre-existing things about being human. There were pre-existing things about being on earth that were not creations of my attitude, of my mind, of my learning, of my skill set, that, that were there from the very beginning. And that was life-changing because it, it, it meant that I didn't have to do all the work anymore. It meant that it wasn't up to me whether or not I was okay. It wasn't up to me whether I, or not I was happy. It wasn't up to me whether or not I w was able to, to really enjoy my life and, and, and live a good life. It, it wasn't even up to me that I had thoughts in my head. I, like this, this was revelatory to me. Um, can you mute Patty? I think that's where the sound's coming from. I just, um, it's, it's bouncing in my ears a little bit. Thank you. So when I started to see that, I, I, I would hear people in the community talk about look in a direction. Well, you've got to look in a different direction. And I wanted to shake each and every one of my mentors and go, what direction? And I remember, I remember, um, Somebody saying to me, well, look to mind. And I was like, I don't know where that is. And they said, well, look where you don't know where to look. Now, you've probably heard other people talk about this if this isn't your first introduction to the principles. And I'm talking as if it's not. Um, so apologies if it is. But what I came to see is that the direction that was really helpful to look in was towards what's already true. What's already in there. Not what we can create. Now, look, we can still, everything I used to do still is true. You can create all sorts of things with your mind and in the world. That, that, that isn't suddenly untrue because there's a truth behind it. It's just that what seems to really help us as, as human beings, what seems to really ground us, what seems to really allow us to be in the world in a beautiful way is what we, what we discover that's already there. And so I, I was thinking about some of the different ways that we talk about the difference between these, these two worlds. So the one that 
that Sid used to talk about a lot is the difference between the formless and the form. So there is a formless reality that exists before the formation of time, space, and matter. You know, he used to say life is a divine dream suspended between the boundaries of time, space, and matter. So time, space, and matter are part of the created world, but there's something before that. There's something out of which everything is born and back into which everything, I'm going to use the word dies, but it's not necessarily birth and death. Even that is the metaphor for comes into being, goes out of being, comes into form, goes out of form. Whatever that is, that form comes out of and goes back into, that's part of the discovered world. That's part of the real world. So in Eastern religion, they often talk about the real world and the illusory world or the temporary world. Well, their, their, their time scale is a little different to ours when they're talking about temporary. Anything that comes into being and will one day not be in being, even if it's millions and millions of years from now, is part of the temporary world, is part of the created world. That which it comes from is part of what in the East they call the real world, the permanent, the unchanging, that which was never born and can never die. And that is the eternity in us. That is the infinite in us. That is the place in us that when, in, in the definition of the word namaste, when you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, there's only one of us. And, and that's what the principles point to. That's what the principles are an attempt to describe is the nature of that which is already there, was there before you came along and will be there long after you're gone. And there's a real comfort in that. There's a real solidity in that. There's, you know, they talk about with, uh, with young children that, that one of the big evolutionary stages in the brain is object permanence. So, you know, that's why peekaboo is so fun for little kids is because there's no object permanence. So um, they literally, when, when, when they can't see you, you're gone, and then they see you, and oh my God, you're back, and they can't see you, and you're gone. And, and that's why that game is not fun at 40 anymore. It's just for most of us. But, but in the same way, we think of thoughts as having object permanence. We, we have it backwards. We think a thought is there even when we don't think it. But in fact, no, thoughts have no object permanence. Thoughts are like a game of peekaboo with our own mind. They're a game of peekaboo with the universe. But because we treat them as though they exist even when we don't think them, we get ourselves into a real muddle. We get ourselves really mucked up because we are continually reckoning with things that only exist when we're thinking them. And we think if we're not thinking about them, we're in denial. Well, it's not denial to not show a movie. I mean, when the movie's on the screen, we can pretend it's not. That would be denial. But not thinking about something is, is nothing to do with whether or not we believe in its existence. We believe in its possibility for creation. So here's, 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 a, here's another way that I sometimes talk about the difference. It's the difference between what's created and that which creates. Right? What's created is different moment to moment in our experience, and it's different over time in our lives. But that which creates never changes. That's what we're pointing to when we point to principles, fundamental, unchanging, unchangeable truths. Things that have permanence. So one of the tricky things about language and one of the reasons that I, I don't like to say things the same way too many times is because it's too easy to 
agree with the words and miss what the words are attempting to describe. It's too easy to disconnect language from reality. And so to talk about just mind consciousness and thought, mind consciousness and thought, right? It's too easy to go, oh yeah, yeah, I understand mind consciousness and thought, but, but for the words to be disconnected from what they're attempting to describe. So if I'm using the word mind, if we're talking about mind, it's an attempt to, to point to, to encapsulate, to somehow make visible the invisible creative energy behind life. Right? That which runs through us without which we would not be here. Life begets, this is a Sarah Bernhardt quote, life begets life, energy begets energy. Actually, I like the second part of the quote too, which is that it is by spending oneself that one becomes rich. But, but that's just the nature of life. That's the, you know, if you've ever watched a good post-apocalyptic movie, you know that there, there's always a shot at some point of, of like a plant coming up through the concrete through the rubble, in the desert. That's that life force. That's evidence of that life force. That's the universal mind. That is the divine in us. That is spirit. That is the God in us. That was there before we were there. It's there whether we know it or not. Carl Jung had a sign over his door and uh, on his tombstone in Latin that translated to invoked or not invoked, God is present. That's another way of pointing to the permanence. That is something that is there, whether we're paying attention to it or not, defining it or not, anthropomorphizing it or not, believing in it or not. A way that uh, I, I sometimes talk about it is the difference between discovery and creation is the, the difference between physics and engineering. So physics is a description of the, the rules of the game, the nature of the physical universe. So engineering is what we do with that. Well, the principles are like the physics of human being. They're like the physics of the mind. That there is this creative intelligence that's always flowing, this life force that everything is made up out of. There's a creative potential, that, a translating mechanism that we call thought that brings the formless into form that Sid described endlessly as the missing link between the formless and the form, between that which creates and that which is created. And there's this capacity for experience, this capacity for understanding, this ability to know ourselves at deeper and deeper levels and to see what's going on at deeper and deeper levels that we call consciousness. And the interplay of these three forces are what every experience that we can have is made up of and in fact are what we are made up of because we are temporary we are part of the illusion within the the permanent within the real another way uh, this is a way that um uh, george pransky talks about it sometimes is you know Learning about the principles is, is a mining operation, not a manufacturing operation, right? We're looking for what's already in there. We're not looking for what we can create with it. What we can create with it's cool too, right? Big fan of what we can create with it. But that's, that's not the principles. The principles are that which creates. And so... Uh, I'll, I'll do one more and then I'll, I'll hush up and, and, and we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Natural versus normal, right? The, the most powerful things for us to see are, are what are those things that are innate in us, that are natural, that are part of our nature. 
that we can we can mess with, but we can't fundamentally destroy. Right? Sid talked about self-esteem. It's just, that's part of our nature. Right? That's not something we have to cultivate and, and create confidence. It's part of our nature. It's a way of describing how we are when we're not caught up in our own self-conscious thinking. Right? So much of what we look to create in ourselves is innate in ourselves. And so much of what we think is innate in us, oh, I'm just a depressive person. Oh, I'm just not very bright. Oh, I'm just this. Oh, I'm just that. That's the created. That's what we've learned. Oh, I'm shy. Oh, I'm, you know, one of my favorite um, Sid stories was the, the, the story he tells about how he, sort of the precursor to his enlightenment experience, where he was talking with this psychologist and the psychologist, and they were talking about their insecurities, and the psychologist said, oh, you're not insecure, Sid. You just think you are. Well, that's the difference between what's real and what's created. What's true and what we think is true. You're not shy. You just think you are. You're not scared. You just think you are. You're not insecure. You just think you are. You know, in a very prosaic way, but kind of fun, uh, the film producer Mike Todd once said, I, I've, been, I've been broke many times in my life, but I've never been poor. Right? Nobody's denying life circumstance. Nobody's denying the in-the-moment reality of your experience that you're having, whether it's a fear or insecurity or shame or guilt or whatever it is. But those feelings have no object permanence. They're a game of peekaboo with your own mind. They're a game of peekaboo with the universe. And the second you stop thinking them, they literally cease to exist. They blink out of the universe in that moment. But something deeper remains. And that's the realm of discovery. And that's the direction that everyone is, when you, when you listen to the recordings and you, you read Sid, and that everyone is exhorting you to look in that direction. Go on a, a discovery mission. Go on an exploration of what's true regardless of what you think. And what you think will sort itself out over time. And that's the promise of the principles. That's the gift of understanding the principles. That's the, that's the gift of Sid's articulation of the principles as a way of understanding what was there long before Sid. That's the difference between the principles as a description of fundamental truth and the principles as a methodology or a community, right? We're a principles community, but the principles don't care, right? They're not exclusive to us. They're working in every other community in the world exactly the same as they're working in us. It's just that our consciousness of them, our understanding of them informs, it enlivens, it, it, it educates, it supports us in whatever it is that we do. And that's what makes us a principles community, not the principles. So uh, th thus endeth the sermon for this morning, and uh, we'll uh, pass it over. And, and uh, however, I don't know how you do this, but I'm happy to take as many questions as are out there. Yeah, just to remind everyone, you're all muted now, but if you want to ask a question, there is a little microphone down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So you can unmute yourself. And then when you're not talking, if you would mute yourself again, that would be great just for the, the background noise. Silence in a, in a sort of a, a quasi-spiritual community is much easier for me to take than when I used to do sketch comedy. Because then if people didn't say anything, it was because we weren't funny. But, but, but I can pretend that you guys are just having like a deep, beautiful feeling and that's why you're quiet. So carry on. Well, 
I have a question if uh, no one else is going to pipe yeah, up. Go for it, Eric. <laughs> uh, something I've been curious about for a long time um, is why separate consciousness and mind? You know, from my spiritual explorations, it seems like they're really the same thing, but my guess it's, is that it was formulated that way. You know, when the psychologist picked up uh, Sid's teaching understanding you know as a teaching tool they basically to make it more understandable and i'm curious about your take on that yeah i i i've heard it i've heard sid talk about it and i've heard other people talk about it in different ways and so i'll, I'll kind of share how i've heard them talk about it and how it looks to me so you know the story of the blind men and the elephant right that seven blind men were sent to an elephant and and and, and one of them said, ah, it was feeling the tail and went, ah, an elephant is very like, um, you know, it's, it's very like a, a snake. And, and uh, another one went to the leg and said, no, an elephant is very like a, a, a tree trunk. And, you know, somebody else felt the ears and went, no, an elephant is very like a bat and so on and so forth. And there's something about trying to describe oneness that is so futile that you either become a silent guru um, and there have been them over time and just sit in bliss and kind of trust the resonant energy of mind to, to do it for people. Or you find ways of talking about aspects of the oneness that make it easier for people to see. And so uh, you know, I've heard recordings of Sid talking about that there is only one principle. But if he didn't talk about it as three principles, he would never have anything to say. And the way it looks to me is that there is one universal energy. And one characteristic of that energy is that it 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 has a, a an aliveness to it, a crackle to it, and an intelligence to it. That that it 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 knows somehow to turn plants towards the light so they grow. It it knows to turn acorns into oak trees. It knows how to keep our heart beating. It 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 has an intelligence in it. And when we look at that aspect of the one energy we talk about it as mind. Well, another characteristic of this one energy that makes up everything is that it is self-aware. It, it can know itself. It can experience itself. And when we, uh, our, when, when, when our blind mind, you know, our blind man mind touches that bit of the energy, we talk about it as consciousness. And, and then another element of this, this energy is that it can take form at any moment. It can, it can pop into form in thought and in, even ultimately in physical form. And when we talk about that aspect of the energy, we talk about it as thought. So for me, any attempt to pad out a metaphor misses the point of a metaphor, right? So, um, you know, people, you, you know, I'll, I, I'm, I, I, it will come as no surprise to those of you who know me, I, I, I occasionally will trot out a metaphor for things. And, you know, and then somebody will say to me, well, okay, but if, if, if it's like a movie and mind is the projector and consciousness is the screen and thought is the film, then what about digital projection? And I'm like, it's a metaphor. I don't know. Right. And, and, I, and I actually think that it's worth remembering that mind, consciousness, and thought are metaphors. They're attempts to talk about something that is there, but invisible in a way that makes it a little bit easier for people to experience and see. So that's my take, Eric. What, what, you know, how's that land? Yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I think talking about, um, you know, when you talked about mind, that points to that there's this intelligence operating universally um, and consciousness as pointing to the fact that, hey, we're aware. 
that's just a fact. Here it is. <laughs> and uh, it's undeniable. I mean, you could deny it, maybe if you're a philosopher or something, you'd have fun with that. <laughs> but it's pretty hard to deny that uh, mm-hmm. there's this reality of consciousness hearing the words right now. And um, that's pretty, pretty basic. But yeah, I like that. Using the metaphor of the elephant to explain the metaphor of the three principles. <laughs> that was helpful. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, they're just, um, it's just a way of looking at something that's fundamentally one thing, or one not thing. Excuse me. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's, it's, you, you know, I always say to, 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 to like students on the academy and things like that, that, you know, we're, we're pointing to fire with ice. Right, the closer we get to the truth, the less we have to point with. But by the same token, that's our job. So the fact that it's impossible can't be a problem. You just got to kind of do your best. Yeah, yeah. What else can you do? Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. What else is floating around out there? Yeah, Bob? Uh, in our, in the, there's a sign in front of our church right now that says, uh, change your thoughts, change your world. And I kind of have a problem with that because I don't think you can really change your thoughts. The thoughts kind of come and go. And then there's a core value at the church that says, uh, yeah, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. So to me, that's a lot truer that it's the thoughts that we give energy to that uh, cause the change in our world, not, you know, not the other. Does that make any sense or? Well, yeah, I mean, I, look, everything is true at the level of consciousness that it's spoken, right? So one of my, my current favorite Sid quotes is that everyone is doing the best they can given the thinking they have that looks real to them, right? So when I recognized for myself that when I thought happy thoughts, I felt happy, and when I thought sad thoughts, I felt sad, it really just was common sense to try and think more happy thoughts. So change your, change your thoughts, change your world was, you know, exactly what, what I was up to because that was – how the world looked to me. That's how, how, what I could see of how it worked. The more I've been in discovery mode, right? The more I've looked, the more I've explored, the more I've seen that in, in my mind, not only can we not really change our thoughts in a particularly deliberate way, though we sometimes can. I sometimes can. I can sometimes deliberately shift modes. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I can't, but that in a way, the, 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 the gift is to be able to drop thought. The gift is to be able to step out of what I'm thinking now and just go back to the space that thoughts come into. Because the more I can rest in consciousness, rest in the space within, rest in that, the mind through which thoughts come, the more... Thoughts come and go, and the more beautiful thoughts seem to show up. So if, if that sentence was, when thought changes, the world changes, to me, that would be a description of truth. But the problem with truth is we always try to turn it into advice, right? The problem with description is we always try to turn it into prescription. Look, it's true. When thought changes, the world changes. That doesn't mean that you should change your thought to change your world. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not, but it's, it's a different conversation. It's an engineering conversation. It's a creating conversation, not a discovery conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. Thank you yeah. very much. You're welcome. And I'm sure you would have a very interesting conversation with the pastor of your church if you chose to. <laughs> What else is out there? What would be fun for us to talk about? We 
we, we could retitle this, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About the Three Principles But Were Afraid to Ask. I'm not saying I can answer, by the way. I'm just kind of putting it out there. I... I'll chirp up. Yeah, go for it. Uh, thank you for this, by the way, Michael. This is really cool. You're welcome. Um, it, I've really been sort of, it's been kind of dawning on me lately. Um, and it kind of points to what you were saying earlier about uh, the more you get this, the less words there are to describe it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, what that means for me personally is that the less I analyze it, the more the thoughts drop away. And as the thoughts drop away, the body seems to relax because it, it seems to me that when we have a, a problem thought, quote unquote, you know, uh, there's a, there's a physical reaction. And, uh, you know, it's sort of that whole fight or flight reflex, you know, that whole thing. And so we go into that stress mode. And when we, recognize where the feelings are coming from when we recognize the nature of thought it relaxes the body and the thoughts drop away and in that relaxation we become more open to who we really are you know we can be we become more open to uh just the openness and the, you know, the, the, the truth of what you're pointing to, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. You, you, so there, there's a, there's a couple things in that. Um, one is y y psychosomatic is not an insult. Now, I know, I know that's not what you were saying, but, but, but people sometimes, you, you know, when I, when I'll talk with clients about, you know, how, how health is psychosomatic, They'll go, no, my problems are real. A doctor has told me. And it's like, no, 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 no. All psychosomatic means it's a description that the psyche and soma are intimately connected, that thought is experienced in the body. Like, that's all. It's, it's, not, it, it's not saying you're faking it. It's saying that's how it works. And when you start to see that, then it makes sense that when your psyche's less tight, your soma is less tight. That when thought is flowing, which seems to be the design of the mind, which is just a flow through of thought, then the body flows too. The energy flows in the body as it flows through the mind. Now, what's interesting is that traditional psychology is, is kind of built on the premise that that which flows through the mind is important. So if you, if you imagine a, 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 a stream, uh, you know, a kind of a, a country stream that has, you know, lots of sticks and branches that run through it, psychology goes, ooh, which sticks are running through it? And, and oh, oh, there's an awful lot of brown sticks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have a DSM five description of what it means when there's a lot of brown sticks and there's a lot of blue sticks and there's a lot of, I, there probably are no blue sticks, but just bear with me. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of leaves, oh, leaves. Well, leaves is a sign that blah, 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 blah. And, 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 and the great joke is that what's being missed is the river. That the river is always flowing. It's carrying all that stuff through. And, and it's not that things can't get stuck and bunged up and that the river can't get a little bit blocked, but the river will always find a way. Right? Dams don't hold in that sense. You know, metaphorically, yes, but what about the boulder dam? No, 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 it's a metaphor. In our little rural stream, right? Things can get a little dammed up, but you give them a nudge and then the river continues to flow. We are the river, we are the flow, that is our nature. And the particular sticks that happen to be flowing through it at any given time are interesting, but they're not the point. 
they're not who you are. They're just the particular sticks that happen to be flowing through, flowing along the river of, of, of your mind of thought in the moment. And there's something really liberating about that, about not having to worry about which particular sticks are there at which particular times. There's something incredibly freeing about that. I had a client who said, I was just talking about him the other day. He, he had been, you know, he was, I couldn't understand why he wasn't more successful because he, he was trying to get a new business off the ground. He seemed very competent. He had all the right background. He had connections. He had everything that I would normally think is helpful to have in business. And he, he would just keep saying, I just don't have time. And, and one day I finally just said, well, what do you do? And we sat down and looked through what he did in a typical day. And he was spending 16 hours a day thinking. And it was like, wow, you know, you're right. You don't have time, but boy, can you get that time back in a heartbeat? And, and once he kind of saw that, you know, he didn't have to think about stuff as hard as he was thinking about it, the river started to flow. And of course, new ideas came to mind, new thoughts came to mind, and he was able to build his business. But it's, you know, it's often something as simple as that. We think we need to pay attention to the sticks when life is the river. Yeah, it's, 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 we're always okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Cool. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Joe. Um, I have to give a talk a little later today to the Rotary Club on the topic of stress. And it seems these people have noticed somehow that there's an election coming up. Really? Yeah, and are you based in the, are you based in the colonies? Uh, I am, I am, uh -huh. um, or the expansion from the colonies, anyway. Um, yes, so um, I have some ideas of what I'll I'll say, but I wondered if you had some fresh thoughts about it. I know you alluded to it on your radio show recently, but uh, about what specifically about the elections? About because um, there's it's. When I mentioned that I would be speaking on stress, they go, oh, that would be perfect now, especially since everybody's so concerned about the election. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, just looking for maybe a fresh thought or two about it that I might be able to. Well, I mean, not, not, not related to like what you'll say to the group, but just thinking about it, mm -hmm. right? What a, what a great laboratory to see if it's really inside out. Yeah. Right, because because it's it's very easy to to think, ah, oh, yes, my nature is well being when when everything looks the way you think it should look in the outside world, right? That that doesn't prove anything, right? You know, it's it it's like it's like when Nino was um, in labor for for um, with Oliver um, with baby number one, uh, there was a moment where they put um, the epidural into her spine. And it was the most dramatic change I'd ever seen. I was actually like thinking of investing in epidural stocks <laughs> because she literally went from agony to, ooh, isn't there a copy of Hello Magazine? And, and oh, you know, we brought a little Game Boy and, you know, let, let me play Super Mario. And then the next contraction hit and it turned out the epidural hadn't worked. But, but she happened to be in a lull between contractions and thought that the epidural had worked. Well, when everything in your life looks the way you think it should, it's very easy to think you really get this innate well-being stuff. But it's, it's when things don't look the way you think they should look on the outside that you get to see for yourself, hang on, is, is my well-being dependent on who gets elected as president? Because if it's really inside out, it can't. Right. Is my stress really dependent on who's ahead in the polls? Because if experience is 100% thought created in the moment, well, it can't be. And so there's, there's actually something about seeing that we can live life with grace when we think it's not going our way and with gratitude when we think it is 
that, that really points to something fundamental about our role in the creation of the, of our personal universe. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what occurs to me. Well, it's, it's very helpful to me. Um, cause it's uh, watching the whole situation has been a big litmus test to me N now. Um, <clears throat> I'll be speaking to people obviously have no, um, uh, versing in the three principles, as far as I know, there could be a, a one or two there who've heard about it. But um, in, in terms of just sharing it on a simple level, I, I know how to talk to them about stress in general and where, where stress is imagined. Well, here's, here's what's interesting, Joel. Here's what occurs to me, right? There are people just as upset and stressed about your candidate's success in the polls as you are about theirs. What's that about? Like, how is it possible that we can feel the same feelings about opposite facts and opposite feelings about the same facts? What is it in us that makes that possible? Because that's true, right? Yeah. right? There, are, there are people who are just as worried about your candidate winning as about my candidate winning. Like, what, what's that mechanism of worry that's independent of the facts? Because we can both experience it in, in, in completely opposite scenarios. Like that for me opens up a conversation about it's got to be something in us that does it. It can't be the circumstance. Yeah. And, 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 and it is interesting. And I mean, you know, this isn't necessarily remotely helpful, but one of the things that I have found to be incredibly valuable and 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 you know i just did a, a one of the podcasts about it in the last couple of weeks is there are really intelligent people in the world who disagree with you right those are the people you want to talk to not to change your mind but to broaden it like how is it possible that intelligent people disagree with you now, forget, there are, yeah, there's a lot of unintelligent people who disagree with you too. That's true. <laughs> you know? but, but when you start to see that, it opens up seeing, oh, the way I see the world is the way I see the world. The world is much bigger than any seeing I could possibly have. The elephant is not like a bat or like a worm or like a snake or like a tree trunk. And how one sees the election is not how the election is. And that just opens up the whole world of separate realities and of thought and, and of the, the created worlds that we, you know, we create and then live inside the, the horror stories that we, you know, I really, it's, I, I use the metaphor in the TED talk, but it's, it's to me still the most accurate metaphor. We, we draw pictures of monsters and then we run screaming from the room. We make up life in a way that scares us, and then we try to cope with the fear. We make up life in a way that creates feelings of stress in the body, and then we want techniques to help us cope with the stress. Mm. Well, if you don't make up the stressful, scary story, you don't need the techniques to deal with the stress. If you don't take the poison, you don't need the antidote. That's the promise of this. That's what's on offer. Great. That's very useful. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Hello, Michael. Hey, Nicholas. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Oh, thank you. I have, uh, can I ask you two questions? Sure. Uh, I've heard you. Um, I've heard you say that uh, we we do not get to choose our uh, thoughts. Like, uh, uh, and, and I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that because to me it seems like uh, if I uh, if I set the time to like tomorrow at one p.m. I'm going to think about my mother, for example, it seems to me that 
the chances are that I'm going to think about my mother at that time. So it would be very interesting to hear a little bit more about um, uh, what, what, what you mean by, by uh, that we don't get to choose her. So, so for me, I would describe what you're talking about as directing our attention. Right. Like we can direct our attention in a direction. Mm-hmm. So we can go, okay, at 1.30, I'm going to think about my business for half an hour or I'm going to think about my mother for half an hour or something like that. And chances are, because of the nature of the mind, it's responsive. Mm -hmm. You know, when we aim in a direction, we tend to get thinking about that direction and we will have, have have thinking about that. We're still not choosing our thoughts. Mm -hmm. The specific thoughts that come up aren't up to us, Mm -hmm. but we can kind of aim them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even that doesn't work, right? (laughs) That's right. The alarm goes off and you're just like, I am so into this. I am not thinking about my freaking mother. Right? You know, it's, you know, so it's not even a done deal. But, but that would be one distinction is, is that we can direct our attention. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you really want to kind of see how little control you've got, mm-hmm. <laughs> where did the thought come from to direct your attention in that way? Yeah. You didn't choose that. That occurred to you. Mm -hmm. So even the idea to direct your attention towards a particular kind of thought Mm -hmm. comes from nowhere. It comes Mm -hmm. from the thought factory. It comes from mind. It comes from, I don't know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. It's mysterious. But I know that I didn't choose it. I didn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't decide. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it had to occur to me first. Mm -hmm. And that relationship, seeing, again, not creating, discovering what is our relationship to thought, mm. that's a really rich territory to explore. Yeah. Because for me personally, the, the more I've seen it, A, it's not up to me what I think. That takes a huge amount off my mind because it used to be up to me what I think in the way that the world used to be flat, Right. So I used to have to really be on it. And, and so my job, my life got much easier when I lost that job. But on the <laughs> other hand, it's also useful to know that I can direct my attention and I can get creative thought about anything simply mm-hmm. by aiming my mind in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I, I win both ways. Yeah. Mm. Very nice. Cool. Was, it, was, it, was there a part two? Uh, sure. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit about uh, uh, values. How does values fit in to, or how does it relate to the three principles, uh, the understanding, like human values? So by values, do you mean like something we gravitate towards in life or something that we think is important or gives us uh, like human needs and those kind of stuff that we, we are drawn to or think that we feel good about. Or So let me, let me just put a little disclaimer that there's a very, very high probability that I'm about to talk crap. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because, like, I, I have an opinion, but it's an opinion. This is not sure. the principles, wisdom okay. throwing down. It's like, you know, my take. Yeah. It seems to me that there are some things that are innate in us to do with compassion, mm-hmm. to do with, like, like, there's something in us that sees a, a baby or a, a small animal and, and just is drawn to it. So that would be what I would call a, an innate value. We seem to mm-hmm. have an innate value for life. It can be overridden. It can be totally overridden. We can, but it seems to be there in all living creatures. Mm-hmm. Right? That's where you'll see those cool YouTube videos where like a, you know, a, a mother bear will take care of a baby badger, right? It's, it's like that seems to be within the, the nature of living creatures mm. to, to, to kind of respect for life. 
values like um, money, uh, uh, um, respect, you know, values that show up on a Tony Robbins exercise, <laughs> those to me seem to be part of the created world. And the fact that, in fact, you can move them around a list and change them would mm -hmm. suggest that they are made up. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing is that we don't see how arbitrarily they get made up. Like I, 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 I did a program once and we were talking with a group about um, cheating, what, what constituted cheating on your partner. Mm -hmm. and, and the range of answers went from if my partner looks at an, an, another person and has a sexual thought, that's cheating, to, well, as long as they don't cheat on me with the same person for more than three months, it's not really cheating. Oh. <laughs> now, this is the thing, is you start to see, oh, wait, we make this stuff up. Mm. That's part of the created world. And in the created world, all bets are off because we're making it up. There's not a right created world. So discovering is looking for what is universally true for all people. What was true before I got here is true regardless of what I think and will be true long after I'm gone. Mm. That's the foundation for a rich life. That's your grounding mm. in the principles. That's what will serve you in good stead, whatever you go out and do in the world. Mm. And that's my take. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. That was perfect. Great. Bunny, how are we for time? Or I can, I, can, um, I, I can go longer if we go longer, but if we are supposed to stop tight to time, then we're... Um, I'm, I'm good to go longer if people have more questions. Okay. So uh, we'll leave it with you. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi. Hey. Hello, uh, I'm in Wales in the UK. And and but, can I say your name out loud? Because just because I never get to say Zebedee. Yeah, and it is almost time for bed. <laughs> um, so I have a question. I'm I'm doing the institute with one thought. I don't you know who one. Yeah, yeah, I did. yeah. Um, and there's lots of kind of talk about the feeling in the room and the connections and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I had, a, I had a phone call with somebody and she said, oh, I felt like that was a really awkward call because normally we talk on Skype and I felt like we were interrupting each other. And I said, well, I felt it was really nice actually. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and I had a really different. Yeah, I'd had enough of that. I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm I think sorry. In Wales, in Wales, there's a pigeon that goes past the satellite and the internet goes down. Um, sorry, what, what did you hear? No, so, so actually you heard most of that. So, so, um... Well, my question is, I suppose, that it, like on that call, I had a really good feeling of the call and I had a really good feeling about the conversation. And then this other person had a different feeling about the conversation. And there's lots of talk about this kind of connectedness and feelings, but we are in our own separate realities. And I find I get a little confused in that space. So here's remembering that language is metaphor, right? So there, there, there's no truth in language, even if language is being used to describe truth. When we talk about the feeling in the room, it's a way of trying to describe the fact that when I'm not caught up in my personal thinking and you're not caught up in your personal thinking, we, we, we kind of are able to rest together in mind. We're able to rest together in, in what Sid called pure consciousness uncontaminated by personal thinking. Now, it's not really a feeling in the room as such. It's the feeling of unadulterated consciousness that is always present, but usually we don't notice because we got so much going on in our heads. And so when people get quieter in their minds, quieter in their thinking, there's the kind of a shared feeling that's tangible. People know it. I, I gave a talk in the, 
in the prisons uh, a couple of years ago, and my son came, who was 18 at the time. And, and at one point, the, the entire 70 gang members, it went quiet as a pin drop. It was beautiful. It was tangible. We all felt it. You looked at everybody's eyes and they were all lit. And, and I commented on it. And, and you know, I, I said to them, I said to these guys in the prison, I said, you're home. And about 50 of them went, yeah. And about 20 of them went, no, we're not. We're in prison and got back up in their heads and blah, blah, blah. But, but like my son asked me about it afterwards. He said, what was that? And I said, I don't know. But it, I think what it is, is it's what's always there underneath the noise of our minds. And when you get two or more people who get quiet together, it sort of amplifies it somehow. And then we talk about it as the feeling in the room. So what I would, my, my guess as to what happened on your call was you didn't have a lot on your mind, so you were in a pretty nice feeling and they had a lot on your mind, so they weren't. What do you, what do you think? Um, I think that makes sense. I just, uh, I, I just kind of, I guess just kind of struggle with this idea that that's contagious. But then when you say you're in a room full of 70 gang members and 50 of them kind of seem to be in the feeling and 20 aren't, there seems to be a sort of an idea that it's so contagious, everybody catches it at the same time that maybe I'm blowing it up into something bigger. In, bigger yeah, in it, sound, it does sound like you're, you're making it. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I guess, look, I had an, let, me, let me tell you a different one. I, w- I was giving a talk at a church in London and um, a woman came up to me uh, after the talk and she said, oh, that was great. She said, I finally got my husband to come along to an event and he hated it. I was like, wait, (laughs) why is that great? And she said, well, he said it felt really weird in there, like a, like a cult. And, 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 and I'm still in my mind going, and the great part is, and, 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 and she said, he felt it. He didn't know what it was and he didn't like it, but he could feel it. He could feel the quiet. See, that's the thing. It's not that people can't feel it. It's that they're very busy minded, so they don't, and they don't have a respect for it because they just think, oh, yeah, it's nice. They don't see that actually it's the gateway to everything. So, you know, Winston Churchill once said that, you know, m- most men stumble across the truth from time to time, but then they stand up, dust themselves off, and carry <laughs> on as if nothing happened, right? Okay. It's contagious, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to notice. And and one of my little, one of the few lines I have that I do like to repeat is, you know, wouldn't it be a shame to have a wonderful life and not notice? Wouldn't it be shame to have access to these beautiful feelings and not notice? Thank you. That's very helpful. Great. Thank you. Let's say two more if they're out there. Hi. Hey, Kristen. Hi. Calling from Salisbury Island. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) I've heard of that. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I wanted to go back to uh, when we were talking about choosing our thoughts. And I guess more getting into the idea of personal thought versus universal thought um just to describe what i'm talking about uh, i've had the experience often that you know i might be in a really quiet place and just not having a lot of thought and then something will occur to me and i'll kind of you know i'll i'll kind of go like just see it and and just see it as being like a really good idea or you know and just interpreting it as well this is like universal thought this is something that has just occurred to me and then you know and then just you know I guess like you know I do get into that mindset thing oh yeah this is a great idea great you know but then at a later time 
I kind of look at it again, and it just seems like a really bad idea. So it's like, yeah, I guess I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to get an understanding of how we can identify something as being universal thought as opposed to personal thought. So. Can you can you just mute it while I'm talking, Kristen? Because it, yeah. it's, it's buzzing in my ears, and then you can come back off. First off, you know, I was watching everybody kind of nodding, and clearly, you're the only one who has that experience. But but one of the there's a few things that that, that occur to me to say about that. One one is, look, it's all universal thought. Like universal thought is the principle that allows us to have personal thinking. It's not really two separate types of thought. But there is, in, in my experience, a different feeling to that which comes up in me from the quiet and, and with a sort of a peaceful feeling than that which gets me excited. Like, like I, I, for a while, I, I had a period in my life that I used to, I, I called the My Two Dads era where I was being coached by a traditional empowerment, go get him tiger, Tony Robbins type coach and George Pransky for the same year. And it really was schizophrenic. It was like, you know, this one guy would be like, yeah, let's go out there and change the world. And George would be like, Hey, (laughs) and I remember saying to George once during that year, why is it that when I talk to my, my traditional coach, I come away like ready to run through a wall and really pumped up and excited. And when I talk to you, I come away feeling, hmm. And, and all George said is he said, I don't think that feeling that you're calling motivated and pumped means what you think it means. Now, I didn't understand that at the time, but I look back and I, I see the health problems that, that, that came up in me that year when I was running through walls and the stress levels and the craziness in my home life that all came from my thinking that that feeling was like, yeah, was what I was after. And what I've seen since is that what I would call inspiration versus motivation, what I would call that quiet knowing, um, that serves me incredibly well in my life. So it doesn't, it doesn't do to get too anal about it. And go, now, is this this or is this this? Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're screwed. Just the very fact that you're caught up in that question means you, you don't have a hope in hell until, you're, until you don't care again. But, but you can get a feel over time. You can get a feel over time for where you're what it is to be inspired and gently moved by the river and what it is to be caught up in the excitement of your own thinking. Does that have a resonance? Yeah. Yeah. That that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, And so, like I said, one more, if it's out there, otherwise we will, we will call it a webinar. Going once, going twice. Well, thank I you. Can, <laughs> I can I can ask another one. I have plenty of questions. <laughs> All right, sneak it in. Uh, I have a question about. I, I know you come from an NLP background, so to speak, and and me too. And uh, so I, I caught the three principles uh, while I'm I was chasing chasing some uh, NLP stuff and and all of a sudden th- three principles stuff came up and so so it's this is a really really nice ride I'm doing right now but I'm a little bit interested in how was it for you uh, uh, when you came to know this did you do both NLP stuff and three principal stuff at the same time, or was it like a clean cut, or how did you transform? Oh, it was. It, I, I would say it was messy, sloppy, uncomfortable, um, uh, poverty-inducing. It was a mess mm. because I really tried to 
to make them fit. But what I didn't mm -hmm. see is I was trying to blend truth with make-believe and, and treat them of equal value. Yeah. And, and there came a point where I couldn't do it anymore. Mm. So, so I, 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 you know, I, I wanted it to fit and I worked very hard to make it fit. And at a certain point, it just became obvious to me, bullshit just doesn't taste like truth. <laughs> and I lost my taste for bullshit, no matter how positive it was. And I really developed a taste for truth. But don't get me wrong, I tried. <laughs> I'm kind of in the same place, I think. <laughs> yeah. I always remember a story um, about William Penn, who was the, the first sort of major aristocrat to become a Quaker. And he was a kind of pain in the king's backside. And so the, the king kept threatening to have him killed. And his, his dad, who the king owed money to, said, you know, no, 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 don't have my son killed. We'll, we'll exile him to, to the colonies. And, um, and so, hence Pennsylvania. And, and, uh, and one of the things that William Penn was troubled by when he first became a Quaker is there's an admonition in the Quaker faith that you shouldn't ever touch a weapon. But as, no, as a wealthy man, for him to not carry a sword would be basically inviting death and robbery and all that. And so he really struggled with that. And one of the, one of the Quaker elders said to him, wear your sword with full awareness for as long as you possibly can. And if the time comes when you can't wear it anymore, take it off. Mm. And for me, that's always been a nice touchstone. We don't need to act like we get it. It doesn't serve anyone for us to act like we get it and to, to act all three principally, whatever we think that is. Uh, oh, I'm a three principles person, so I don't have emotions anymore or whatever the <laughs> heck we make up. That, that actually there just comes a point at which it doesn't make any sense to you anymore to do things the old way. And at that point, you'll stop doing it. Yeah. You know, and that messy though it was, that served me very well. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Um, thank you for having me. And I hope I'll see a bunch of you at the, uh, at the, at the conference next week. Thanks, Michael. I was just about to bring that up. First of all, thank you so much. Um, this was a wonderful hour to spend with you. And thanks for going over a little bit. It was really generous of you. I, I know that you're a not very busy man. I, I, I read your last book. <laughs> and, um, and so I was just going to mention that uh, the Three Principles Conference, uh, Three Principles Global Community Conference, starts in two weeks. It's on October 27th through, it's Thursday through Sunday. And Michael will be speaking there. And I just wondered if you'd like to say a few words about it, Michael. Well, just if you haven't been to a conference, there, 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 there are more and more conferences cropping up. The two conferences I most enjoy are, are the 3P UK conference and the 3P GC conference because they've got the, they just seem to get the blend right every year of getting to see the, the people who've been in this conversation for 40 years and, and knew Sid and were influenced by Sid and, and the people like me who never got to know Sid, but have been just touched by the understanding and touched by what we've discovered. And, and so I, I, always, I always think that the great thing about, about learning at a conference is you, you can't chalk it all up to one person's charisma. You know, you can't, like, I always think that the fact that I never met Sid, even though it would have been really interesting, was probably good because I couldn't blame what happened to me on Sid. It had to be true beyond the man who articulated it. And I think there's something beautiful about seeing how so many people have been touched by this understanding in different ways. And then you kind of start to see, oh, they're all saying different things and they're all pointing to the same place and they're all speaking from the same place. And it somehow makes it for me sometimes easier to see the place to separate out the principle from the person. And, and so for me, it's a, it's always a treat. And 
you know, people are, are, are like, well, are you staying? And I'm like, yeah. I mean, the least interesting bit of the conference to me is the bit where I talk. Like, I know what I think. You know, I, I, <laughs> I love being in the room with all these people. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a great vibe. So if you can get up there, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, so if you, um, if you want to know more about it, you can look up a three principles conference dot org. I hope that's right. Look on the bottom of the YouTube video when I, um, when I post it. Um, it's three spelled out, three principles conference dot org. And if you can't make it, we'd love to see you there live in the LA area, but if you can't make it, it's also live streaming. So please consider that as well. And um, we're going to miss the next webinar because the conference is going on, but the, um, we'll pick up on November 10th with John El Mokadem. I hope I pronounced his name correctly, okay. John El Mokadem. So um, thank you for joining us and looking forward to seeing you in the next webinar and at the conference. Hi guys, thank you very much.